Dear class, welcome back to American National Government. Today we're talking about civil rights and civil liberties. What are these? Let's talk about it. So first, what are rights and liberties? Are they the same? Who do they protect and how? How were these rights and liberties introduced into our lives? Here we will consider some of the questions. We're not going to talk about the Bill of Rights in this video, by the way. We will cover that in some fashion in another video. So, framing of the US Constitution. As you remember, the Constitutional Conventions took place in the 1780s and came up with the idea of a strong federal government. With that came concern for how much power states should have versus the federal government. And people were worried that the position of the president would be like that of a king, right? So they got worried about these things. We also saw suddenly legislation is being introduced to talk about checks and balances to ensure separation of powers. So we want to have separation of powers between states and federal governments. We also want separation of powers between executive office, which is where the, um, if you look at the federal government, you have the presidency, legislative bodies, and the judicial branches at the state and federal levels. So the legislative are the lawmakers, right? So that would be Congress if you look at the federal level. And the judicial branch, you're looking at the US Supreme Court at the federal level. And also you want some accountability, some kind of uh, limited powers at, at the bureaucracy levels as well, the agencies that do the work, right? So once Congress and the president come up with laws, somebody has to, you know, laws and also programs like budgets and everything, someone has to actually allocate the money and spend it. And so this falls under all the state agencies like the Department of uh, the State Department, the Department of Interior, the Department of Health and Human Services, Department of Education, Department of Energy, and the list goes on. Accountability. So steps were supposedly introduced for checks and balances or what we call accountability, right? Keep the processes of governing open and transparent, be accountable, have documents to share with the public annually. And so we'll explore this topic later. But they forgot something. What was it? That's right, the rights and liberties of people. So it's shameful they forgot this because they were busy talking about forming the central government, giving a lot of powers, but they forgot about rights and liberties for some reason. And this made a lot of people very worried. We thought it was going to be government by the people, for the people, and of the people. So what happened here? So they introduced the Bill of Rights, right? What are rights? So rights are powers that states give us. we might need the permission of the state if such a thing involves the state. For example, I need permission to vote in the general elections in the US, right? I need to show my ID and citizenship information. If I don't have those, then I may not vote in the US general elections, right? Now, that's something where you have to get the right, the uh, permission of the government. You can just partake in the general elections. Liberties, in contrast to rights, liberties have to do with what I need to live, like breathing, eating, cooking, cleaning, walking, thinking, creating, etc. I don't usually need the state's permission for this sort of thing, right? So why should I need it now? 
So therefore, the founding fathers are making sure that liberties are separate. Government has no right over liberties. So an example of a liberty would be religion, practicing religion, right? We'll come back to that. So are these equal? No, rights and liberties are completely different. Thomas Jefferson. Of all people, Jefferson was a champion of civil rights and liberties, okay? So he pens the U.S. Declaration of Independence. He was one of the main uh, writers of the Declaration and included provisions to abolish slavery in there and for the Bill of Rights. So he was outraged the U.S. Constitution was being penned in his absence from the U.S. while he was in France and that they had left out a Bill of Rights. And he writes about this in his autobiography, if you get a chance, where he basically, these autobiographies are letters that are written by Thomas Jefferson to famous people like John Adams and George Washington and others, right? And sometimes he's just reflecting, it's like he's writing in his personal diary and then that forms a book basically. Um, so he wrote about how John Adams and Washington were talking about the idea of a precedent for lifetime rule. So people were concerned about this. They wanted term limits on presidency. Civil rights and liberties became a major concern when people saw the rise of a powerful central state, as I mentioned. They were worried about threats to liberty of the people and of course, powers of the states. Liberty. Now remember John Locke on the state of nature? He says, people get along fine most of the time in a state of nature by using reason, right? And state of nature here for him means there's no government. So natural rights. He says, people have some natural rights. These are essentially liberties, right? We don't bother people in the state of nature where there's no government because we don't want to get killed by them, right? So we just mind our own business. So people maintain, you know, like distance from people and they, they greet them, they say hello, they are social to an extent, but they don't interfere too much in other people's business. Some liberties, liberties are like that, right? I mean, we just go about practicing your religion for example, this has to do with your relationship with God or, you know, your belief system. And this doesn't really, should not involve the state. That's what the, um, the founding fathers were proposing, that don't let the state tell you anything about certain things, what you need to exist, right? Origin of reasoning. So where does this reasoning come about? Are these common sense ideas, don't kill or you will be killed, or are these God-given morality? Are these about smartness? Um, I mean, if you look at it, it's also about what you need to survive. So one of the liberties in the days when you know you're living in the forest you have to hunt hunting you if you have livestock you have you, you they have to have the ability to eat as well right so even if government is created They have to allow people certain kind of freedoms, otherwise the system will not work, right? If the government is constantly butting into like what we're doing in our houses, that's not gonna work. People are just going to get up and start, you know, taking down the place, right?
Anyway, so we see that there are places where the state really has no business. At least that's the very American way of thinking. And that's a very interesting way of thinking. Not everybody, uh, I think, is politically evolved in this way. Not all states um, allow people to spend time thinking about politics like we do in the US, right? Here we think about liberties, we think about our rights. In many countries, people don't think about those things. It's not part of their educational system. So let's see where we are. And actually, you can thank Thomas Jefferson for that. I mean, to a large part, his whole goal was to create a public education system. So the Bill of Rights are essentially the first 10 amendments that were introduced to the U.S. Uh, Constitution because they forgot to add the Bill of Rights, right? There's concern for what rights people had. So for you to do is to read Chapter 4 very well on the Bill of Rights. There's a discussion for a question about this. See the module for weekly discussions so you can find the question there. And we will talk about the Bill of Rights in more detail later after you complete the exercise. Holding the government accountable. So if you consider the freedom of religion, I mean, religion is considered a, a personal thing. And so the state should really not have any role. It should not tell you which religion to follow whatsoever, right? So there's actually tests to make sure that society is functioning the way it should, to make sure the government is not involved in doing things that are a breach of the, the Bill of Rights. So look at this. There's such a thing as the lemon test, and chapter four goes over it. Individuals can hold accountable the government if it shows favoritism to or discriminates against any religious group over others. So check out the lemon test. And people were actually encouraged to report these issues at some point. And so this would involve K to 12 schools, public schools, because the government, we're talking about the role of the government here, right? So it cannot be private schools. Private schools are allowed to do their own thing. Public schools and colleges cannot. If you're receiving any kind of federal or state funding, then you cannot do this. Question, are there any special preferences to any religions in the US that are offered by the government? Were any groups persecuted? So this is what we're looking at, right? Now, civil rights movement. So once you have the Bill of Rights, you have separation of powers, checks and balances. Why even have a civil rights movement? Why did these people not be happy with the constitution? Why are they not happy? Because the US Constitution did not give rights to all people and or did not respect their liberties. This is a big deal, right? Slavery doesn't respect the liberties of people who are enslaved. Same with indentured servitude. So there were also citizenship restrictions. Who could be a citizen? Who could not be? Who could vote? Who could not? So ability to hold public office. Who is allowed? Who's not? Who counts as an individual for the sake of populations in, in states? Wow, this is a lot of crazy stuff, right? So you saw the US Constitution is set up and there's actual language in there before all these amendments were introduced in which certain kinds of people are not treated as a complete person. Let's take a look. So many people were not considered individuals or capable of making their own decisions. 
such as black people who's, uh, who were counted as three-fifths of people as far as the population counting, you know, the census counts in southern states. Children were considered, I mean, Native Americans were considered children. So they were not allowed to vote. And they, you know, even to this day, voting access for Native American people is very low. And we'll look at these things. So voting rights also were not given to a majority of the population. Women, even white women, they could not vote. Black people could not vote because they were slaves for a long time. And even when they were free, their voting rights were not, uh, they were not honored by the governments. Native nations, so the Native Americans who lived in this country could not vote. Hispanic people could not vote. Asians could not vote and any other people who were not white landed uh, class of men. Basically, you had to have a certain amount of land, you had to be a male, and you had to be white, as in British or English. For a long time, who counted as a white man differed quite a bit. And you looked at some of that, right, with the Irish indentured servants and other indentured servants. Some European, like the Irish, Italian, e the Eastern Europeans and the Jewish men were not always considered citizens. Does this mean they are not really citizens? So discrimination, if you're just saying that only a certain amount of people can vote, that's how it was. And then certain changes had to be made to the U.S. Constitution, right? Amendments 13, 14, and 15 were introduced. 13 abolishes slavery, and 14 and 15 are about employment and equality of opportunity. Uh, 15 is about voting rights. These were made after the Emancipation Proclamation by Abraham Lincoln, right? In 1863, he frees all the African slaves in the U.S. and says... You're now free people and you have exactly the same rights and liberties as every other person who is white. Let's take a look. So why after 13, 14, and 15, by the 1870s, these amendments have been introduced? So everyone should be happy. They should not have anything to worry about, right? However, the federal and state governments, especially in the South, did not enforce these amendments. They created all kinds of blocks to prevent people who were uh, not white, who were poor, and other kinds of uh, restrictions, basically, to keep uh, people out. Also, women. I mean, women had a hard time to vote. Even though these amendments were... Uh, created, women could still not vote in many parts of the country. Amendments to increase access to rights and liberties. So 13th Amendment in slavery, 14th Amendment, life, liberty, and property is protected for all, even non-citizens. Full Bill of Rights has right to due process as well. 15th Amendment prohibits governments from stopping a person from voting based on race, color, or previous servitude. So if you were a slave at some point, after the Emancipation Proclamation, you're free, and then you should not be prevented from voting. The big question, why did these people who were we say the civil, civil rights movement occurred in the 60s, right? So the question is, why did these people wait until the 60s to protest? Or was it actually a much longer movement? And this question is actually framed purposely to see if you're paying attention, right? 
So yes, this is not a movement that began in the 1960s, but you could say that in the 1960s, people were protesting a lot more than usual, and it became a nationwide kind of a movement. Um, but here, of course, you see both people of color and those who are white joining in to protest the government on civil rights issues. However, why did they wait that long? Let's see what's going on. Why did even the minorities and the women wait that long, or did they? So the backstory. Basically, World War II brought an era of prosperity to the US, right? We talked about the New Deal, the government spending, uh, kept the US economy in a stable place. During the war, women took part in government and business sectors as women, oh, sorry, as men went back to war. So World War I, men went to fight. World War II, more Americans went to fight. After the war, however, women were sent back to the homes to take care of their families, right? So they were not happy about this. And eventually by the 1960s, women were ready to organize and protest these conditions. They wanted to be treated like people with minds, creative abilities, and not caretakers, right? They wanted equal pay and opportunities in the workforce. But this is not where it all begins either, right? I mean, this is the, the reasoning for why white people joined the movement in the 1950s and 60s. But the feminist movement is a lot older. As I mentioned, Amendment 12, I mean 13, 14, and 15 took place to end slavery and to give people who were not whites and also women the right to vote and to not exclude people who were previously enslaved or people, you know, non-white people. So why did the why did it take so long? So let's see. The women were actually actively uh, protesting from the 1800s, right? So the civil, what is it? The constitution is created and then women find out they can't vote. So, you know, this is day one of anger and resentment, right? And so women were active during the 1800s to get voting rights, and this continued until 1920, when the US was forced to give women voting rights. And the government did not want to do this. In Europe, Lenin's Bolshevik revolution in Russia had taken place in 1917, and they already gave women voting rights by then. And this completely embarrassed the US government and other Western governments in Europe. And they were forced to give women voting rights. This is happening while the US government was imprisoning and torturing feminist act activists, as you will see. So look at the videos about the voting rights movement, the suffrage movement, and look at the uh, other videos which go over the struggles of ethnic and racial groups in the U.S. So these are not movements that began in the 1960s, but from day one of the presence of slaves in America or of indentured servants from Europe or Asia or of colonized people, the Native Americans, right? So from day one, the struggles begin. And we only saw it sort of uh, become this overwhelming national movement in the 1960s and 70s. So I'm going to stop here. I think we should stop here. Um, we could actually talk about why grant the rights to minorities. I mean, there's politics involved, right? You have minority soldiers fought in the, basically in the American Revolution, the Civil Wars, Civil War and the World Wars one and two. So being a soldier and serving in the war is a path to citizenship in the US. If you serve and you die, your family still gets to be citizen. This is how many people became citizens in the US, right? Uh, inventors, I mean, we had all these famous people 
uh, who were, you know, not white and they were very, very creative, intelligent beings in the U.S. They were inventors. They were great people. We also have, you know, the Hidden Figures movie who saw that Black women were employed as mathematicians in NASA in the 40s and 60s during segregation. They had to sit at the back of the bus and trains, but they still got to be in NASA and lead the way the space program would not have launched without them. Right, so African-Americans, Hispanic Americans, Native Americans, everybody, the Asian Americans will see their contributions. Uh, so why exclude these people? Why the double standards? Race and class wars. So there was a lot of poverty in America before the 20th century, right? People were angry with their governments, as you know. They were having riots over working conditions. Factory workers were extremely upset. Uh, people couldn't find jobs. They had it's basically a poor country until that time. So while they could not take out the frustration on the government nor on the industrialists, so they took it out on the people who didn't have equal rights. They didn't have power, right? So whiteness became like a privilege. You could bully non-whites and get some feeling of power, even though you were poor and your situation was horrible. So that is what people did until the government actually changed the way it ran itself, right? We saw that with the 1880s until 1930s, the government is turning into a more um, a responsible kind of a government which tries to help people, right? So let's stop here for today. That's a long lecture on rights and liberties.